Welcome back to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super awesome podcast interview YouTube show where I, your artist friend Chris Dyer, talks to super interesting creative friends. Uh, today I'm in the very beautiful Bohemian uh, neighborhood of Barranco here in Lima, Peru, and I'll be interviewing a legendary musician called Nikki Gonzalez who is better known as a, as a you know 80s and 90s rock star but he's truly a visionary who has you know done a number of different musical genres and just you know fused ethnic roots from Peru with a bunch of uh, different kinds of everything I have a really hard time uh, describing him but uh, yeah join me in this little conversation I hope you enjoy street of Mickey Gonzalez. Andrea is assisting me today with the filming and he should be out here any second. Hi! Welcome back to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super awesome spectacular podcast interview show where I, your friend, your artist friend Chris Dyer talks and has amazing conversations with beautiful people and his creative friends. Today, my great guest of honor is Miki Gonzalez, who is a legendary Peruvian uh, musician, I would say, but he's, you know, kind of like a classic rock legend. It's hard to define him because he's moved through so many uh, music genres throughout the year, but uh, for you guys who are not Peruvian, he would be like the uh, comparison to like Carlos Santana in our country. So I've been a fan for many years and eventually we've become friends and he's uh, gracing me with a nice conversation today. Como te va, Mickey? How are you doing today? Woo! All good, dude. All good. Thank you for being here and thank you for doing this interview in English also. That's amazing. Where, do you, where did you le learn your English? Well, I'm originally from Spain and m my parents went to live in Venezuela. So we all went there. And my first school was an American school. Okay. So, you know, I had to learn English when I was like three or four. And I could read English before I couldn't Spanish. I taught myself to read Spanish out of what I knew from English. So, so were you born in Spain? I was born in Spain and then, you know, six years in Venezuela. And then when I was nine in 61, we moved to Peru. And then I'm like, like my, my whole career is like... Um, is, is like a fake, el, el cantante nacional, the national singer. I'm not a singer, I'm not even national, so. <laughs> right. So, you know. Well, but you are Peruvian. In the same way, I'm Peruvian. I, 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 grew, I was born in Canada and I spent most of my life in Canada, but I still will always be Peruvian in my heart. Right, because it's, you know, the thing in Peru is it's the, the pre-Hispanic culture is so fascinating that I, I, you know, I, I never left. Right. Yeah. The, the, no, I've been left. sucked back here. I, I was repelled at one point, and now I gotta come here every year and reclaim my Peruvianness, which I love so much. Right. So we're in the the neighborhood of Barranco now. Uh, Barranco I, Cliff. The Barranco Cliff, like right in front of the ocean. Barranco means cliff, so uh, the, yeah. you know. The the barra the cliff of the cliff. It wasn't wasn't hard to give give a name to the neighborhood. I think that. <laughs> Hawk just took a poo in your swimming pool. Um, <laughs> but uh, you've lived in different parts of Peru and, and, and Lima, and now you're in Barranco. What, what do you like about living in this neighborhood? What's special about Barranco? I like Barranco now. I like Barranco because everything is close. Well, this new thing, there's a lot of hipsters moved in. So there's a lot of uh, espresso places and so, you know, food, it's trendy, 
and everything is close by. I, I used to drive. I had a car which I sold in 2015. Okay. So I never bought a, a car back. And um, I, I like it here because, you know, my, my routine is, is all here. You know, like being an adult, you have to pay bills and, and shit. Can I say shit? No. You can shit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like go to the bank and then I, I have, you know, a, a macchiato double four or five in the afternoon. That gives, makes me, you know, pump, get, gets me pumping. Yeah. I'm a night guy, you know, I'm a musician, so I like to be up. Nobody calls me on the phone and you know, I get inspired, no interruptions, no nothing, so. Right, beautiful, yeah. I, I really like Barranco because of its architectural beauty and there's lots of murals these days. Right, right, and uh, yeah, I, I, I moved here originally for the first time in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was not like trendy like it is now. Now it's, there's all these like, they, they, you know, they're new buildings, the old houses, even though some of them are protected because they've been around like, this is like, like, like the Hudson River in New York State. Yeah. All those houses that have been, you know, made like, like country houses and a hundred year old, a hundred something year old. So those are protected. But the other ones, no, they, 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 they destroy them and make buildings, which is like not, not so nice, but you know. Right, we, but we there's still some stop. classic Barranco homes, like the one that your family kept and like this one. So yeah, I think that's what makes Barranco special. If anything. It, yeah, it is, it is special. And so hopefully it's not lost by these things. No, and there's here. a thing here also, you know, for, in, in the, I don't know if people can see, but Lima is a big bay, okay? And then we, we are towards the south, and it's Chorrillos. And Chorrillos, the, the, the way the, the bay goes around makes a little curve. And then it's the coast behind the, the Herradura, that big hill. The coast is straight. So when the, when the, when the fog comes in, it gets pushed by by that mountain there by that hill right and so the fog goes straight to miraflores uh -huh. and so it there's it it, 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 it's, and it skips here it, it it does so the humidity here makes it for like the plants mm -hmm. the, the gardens here you know because th these were all country houses all these houses have gardens and stuff mm -hmm. so the vegetation here is awesome it's, it's really nice so those little details, you know, make it special. Right. My mom grew up in Barranco when they first uh, arrived to uh, Peru in the So where are they? Where are they from? My mom was from uh, from Canada. Uh, it's a crazy story about uh, my family arriving. My si the mom, my mom's side of the family arriving. So my grandfather was schizophrenic, and he was married to another woman before my grandmother and had three kids and then they divorced. Oh, these birds are crazy. And then, um, but so the, my grandfather married my grandmother, but he missed the kids from the first marriage. So he was at the dentist and he's reading this magazine and they had an article about Peru and he's like, huh, this is a cool country that sips a lot of British colonial people, whatever. I think I'm gonna move to Peru, but I'm gonna kidnap my kids from the first family. So. He came up with this crazy plan. He kidnapped his three kids from the first family, took my grandmother and my mom against their will, and they all moved to Peru and bought a nice house in Barranco and lived here. Oh. But five weeks after, the kids got rescued and my parents just kept on, well, my grandfather kept on living here till my grandmother got sick of him and kind of like divorced him too and etc. Yeah. Trippy, trippy way to get to Peru for my mom and her family. And then my grandmother, who was fully English, had to live in Peru for 20 years, fending for the kids and stuff. And yeah, that's how my mom got to Peru at one year old. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask you if you remember how we met. Yeah, we met in Wapa Just Falls. Well, that's where we met in person. But well, you oh, oh, okay. Yeah, no, you wrote me. Right. I, 
basically, I asked Mickey if I could use one of his electronic songs for my documentary. I didn't have any money for him, but he was super nice and said like, oh, if you give me a skateboard for my son who skateboards, it's all good. So the first song, my documentary that everybody loves, that's, that's Mickey, just so you know. And then one day after a cousin visit at Alex Gray's, I went to a random little okay. Mexican <laughs> restaurant. Mexican, yeah. And you can, you can continue telling the story if you want. Yeah, and I was, I was I, I, I've been going to Wappinger Falls because I, I, I study with a Buddhist master from the uh, Karmakagyu school. And uh, I had met him in Boston in, in 81. And then I found him again in 92. Mm -hmm. So I've been going to Wappinger's Falls all, all these years from 92. And then this was 2015, right? Something like that, yeah. It was 2015. Because I, I, I had cancer, oh. throat cancer. Oh, that, I didn't know that. And, uh, and then I did the radiation thing. So I went to that trip, or the trip before that, I went to, to, to talk to my teacher and I said, look, I'm, you know, like it, it's, it's, I know I'm going to die, but you know, it's not, it's not something that I consider, but now it's more clear that I will die. And if the cancer com comes back, it's going to be sooner than, sooner than later. Right. So. I, uh, I was invited to, to spend some time at the monastery and do some, some, some practice and, and service, you know? That, that would keep me, like, focused on that, that moment of death. Yeah, like just uh, finding your peace before right, you Right, right, you know, like connecting with... Because we're all, all, you know, we're all distracted with things and plans and, you know, things to do. And, and eventually when you die, you're, you're not ready. So that was my idea then. And I had, I had gone t to prepare for moving at the monastery. And then you, I, was, I was out at this Mexican place that I'd been there. That was my first time there ever. Mm -hmm. And then you, with, with, you know, some students of my teachers, some, some monks and some non-monks. And then you come in and I recognize you. And, and then that's well, how that's how we we uh, met in, in the physical body. Right. <laughs> I, I was shocked because once again, Wappingers Falls is not New York City. It's a random little town in New random York. Random little town. You bet. <laughs> and I'm at the table, my friend John and Jonas having some burritos. And all of a sudden, you walk up. He's like, "Hey, you're Chris Dyer, right?" And I'm like. Mickey Gonzalez, <laughs> sí, sí, sí. <laughs> which is like, you know, in my mind is like Peruvian rock star. And I was like, holy shit. So yeah, we finally met in person. And yeah. then last year when I was visiting, you're like, yo man, let's go and get some coffee or some lunch. And we got to connect better. And I made the effort to buy your, your vinyl of Akundung for my birthday at this store that had it from 93 and got to sign it. So I was really stoked about that. Right. So yeah, I think it was like very synchronistic uh, way of meeting. But I think you also knew my dad from back in the day too, no? Teddy Dyer? Right, I, because I used to hang out with my surfer friends in, 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 in another neighborhood, which is it's not Barranco, it's in San Isidro and Miraflores. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, our meeting place was out in the street. And then uh, uh, across, across the street, there was a meeting place of other guys who were a little bit older. Uh -huh. That's where your dad was hanging yeah. out. My dad must be like what, five years older than you? I don't know. I think we're about the same. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm going to turn sixty-nine. How old is your dad? My dad is sixty-nine-ish. Right. So you know, but those guys were, I mean, a little. Older. Those they were not surfers though. My dad uh, could surf, but he was more of like a motorcycle car. Right. They guy. they were like you know the, the guys from the hood that was like mo motorcycle guys and that, uh, that's what made us like different and maybe we were in different parts of the corner. Right, right. Uh, you maybe, were more of a surfer. Yeah, yeah, I was I was definitely surfing then. You were surfing down here like yeah. Costa Verde. Yeah, I Yeah, uh, you know Chicama, right? Yeah. I when I was surfing, that's the time that they discovered Chicama. Oh, cool. And they 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 invited us. To, because they, they made a movie about it. Uh huh. It, it was tell, tell the viewers a little bit about Chicama. What makes Chicama special? Chicama, the, the way they, they found Chicama is a, there was a, a pilot 
and he was he was commercial pilot. I I, I understand, and he saw these waves. It's it's a point break. It's a left, but the waves are. It's one of the longest waves in the world, and uh, so he told his surfer friends about these waves, and then these these guys went to look. There's three guys in the Volkswagen, and the other guy he was he was French origin, so he had a, a du chevaux, uh -huh. Citroneta, okay, a little one of those little Citroens. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how they found uh, that. That's, that's how they found that's and discovered a, that's Chicago. A right wave right side wave no it's that's, a left it's a left okay. it's a left yeah it's and that it's you tube, can be, you perfect can, tube you can be on that tube for like half an hour something like that right well is yeah. that exaggeration like five minutes or no not five minutes i heard 10 minutes you can well yeah i don't know i don't know i know when i used <laughs> to go when i was a teenager not that i ever got anything too crazy you could be on that wave for a while but yeah i love chicama too so, I, yeah. I went when there was only el hombre just a lombre and that was it. I don't know how it is today, but uh, how was being, how was Lima or Peru in the 60s and the 70s? Well, yeah, that was, that, that was, the, that's the point. It was, it was like, we knew each other, everybody knew each other because it, the crowd wasn't huge. It was just like a bunch of people. Like, it was longboard time. Mm -hmm. it, it, the, the, like the, the, the smaller board came in 68. So like to me, when they say longboard and like the the little boards, you know, the five foot and so on, that's the normal thing. That's not the normal thing. That's something that. That's the new thing. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's the new old thing or whatever it is. Right. So you're riding those long, like those longer boards. Right. That, no, right. You know, awesome. nose riding and you know, we, it was called hot dogging. Uh huh. Do and you, there's big waves too. So you know, the, the there, there was both. You, you know, still surf a little bit today? No, no. I got back into surfing because my son, he became a surfer. I, I, that, that's the best thing that ever happened to me, you know, to, to be able to ride waves. Also music, let's <laughs> say, you know. But anyway, uh, I never pushed him to be a surfer because when your dad tells you, you do this, do that, then you don't want to do it. You want right. to do the opposite. Right. So. I never told him anything, and then he started surfing, and we started meeting. I used to go with him when he was just learning, and we started meeting people from back in the day. Hey, yo, what's up? What are you doing? No, my son. And then he'd tell me, oh, your daddy was really good. And he'd look at me, yeah, I used to surf, yeah. And then one day, one of these guys said, you know, grab my board and, and you know, how do you say in English, it's paddle out, right? Or yeah. paddle in. If you're going in, paddle in, yeah. I yeah. think so. No, no, in Spanish it's different. In Spanish, voy a entrar, I'm going in. Yeah. No, in, in English it's going out. Oh, okay. When you go in the ocean, I think. I, well, I, I don't know, know if I got it right. Say. Anyway, so I grabbed the board and, and I got three waves and then I came back out on the shore and then my son said, hey man, you, 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 you te, te paraste a la primera, you, you got up the first time. And I said, well, of course I was getting up on the, you know, like st being, being able you're to stand. You're impressing your kid. Right, because he, he, he had a hard time, you know, being standing. He was just learning, so he was very impressed. Nice. And then I started surfing regularly. And eventually in 2012, I lived a whole year in Organos. Okay. And that was... Organos is in the north also. Yeah, that was the most, the most. I, I even got to, to, to ride a small Cabo Blanco, so... Okay. Uh, Beautiful. That's the I like skating in Organos. They have all those uh, waterways for the sewage that you can totally skateboard through. But it. you have to br uh, well, when sweep. When, yeah. Because yeah. there's all this dirt and, there's dirt and stones. And and right, right. But uh, right. yeah, if you use soft wheels in your skateboard, remember, you can like, treat it. I remember anything. watching one, one of your videos that you were sweeping to, to, to ride. <laughs> right, right. If you caught one of my Peruvian adventures, I was yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. up to that at one point. Yeah, yeah I love Organos. Um, so how, but tell me a little bit more about like Peru in the 70s. Was it like cocaine heaven? Like, was it gnarly? Was it cool? Was it fun? Were there hippies? Like, what's well, the, what was the vibe back there? Well, to, to me, to me it was like, it all started in the 60s with the, like the, 
we, because we are from South America, our culture was close to the United States. And I started surfing in 66. And um, 66, there was already, there was a big hippie movement in California. And because I was a surfer, I was closer to California than to what was happening in New York, cult culture-wise. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for example, in 68, somebody showed, 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 it was vinyls then, and it was, it was uh, Velvet Underground and Nico, the banana, Andy mm -hmm. Warhol. Yeah. And it was uh, Freak Out, Frank Zappa. Oh, I love that record. And I went to, I, I immediately I connected with Frank Zappa and not Lou Reed, so weird things like that. And uh, so my thing was, you know, like the California thing, and I was a big fan of Quicksilver, Messenger Service, you know the band? No. It's a band from, from San Francisco. And uh, so, in, you know, when I, then I, I was in my, I don't know how to say, the. When I was in the last year, it was before finishing high school, the doors were on the radio. In 66, Bob Dylan was on the radio with like a Rolling Stone. So that was growing up here, but always like with this admiration for a culture that wasn't from here. Yeah. So this, this is like, we like this culture. We, we like all these things that are happening. But the culture here was like very conservative. And it happened that somebody said to me, there's a, f a photograph guy, a photographer, a guy who shoots photos uh, from California. He's, he's had photos published in Surfer Magazine and he doesn't have a place to stay. He was like 28 and I was 16. And this is my, my last year in high school. And uh, so I met the guy, he was a very cool guy. His name is Leo Hetzel. Mm -hmm. He's still alive, he's still surfing. And he had come from San, from, he was from where? Southern California. LA, some yeah. part of LA, Laguna Beach or one of these places. And he had come hitchhiking. From there? From the United States. Damn, that's a long time. Right, so yeah. So that was the thing. And he had some buddies that were doing the same. He had met people. So that was like, like the thing. So to me, so he came to live in my house and he stayed there. He was, he was a really nice guy. So my parents loved him. And so we would go out surfing and, and, th and then he would tell me all these places that he had m been to and he had been to Nicaragua and then he he could he told me he couldn't hitchhike through Colombia because the the war the war there was so complicated, right. so all these things, and then I was fascinated by uh, by the idea of hitchhiking, mm -hmm. so that was like my 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 how do you say my model, right? Of, Your inspiration, right? So a cool guy doing cool things, being free. And so when I finished high school, I, I really didn't know what to do. And uh, I was sent to a religious university in Pura. And that was very complicated because, you know, being a surfer. And then that, I ended up going to Madrid and, and I wasn't being able to surf at all. And after two years in Madrid, I decided I was going to hitchhike to India. I wanted to go to ne India and Nepal. There was a big thing about the Beatles and Guru Maharaji and, you know, mm -hmm. meditation. So I was into that more than, more than, you know, going to school. So I stopped going to school at all. I didn't go to school. I didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. And I had had for some reasons to come back to Peru. I ended up moving to Cusco because Cusco was the closest to, to India, <laughs> uh -huh. being in South America. Right, it was like, more cultural. And this is like 72, it was like the, 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 the spiritual thing and the, 
And there was there, there was these tribes, these group of people, these groups of people who were from California. I I I knew a group of people who they were all like they were like they, they were not a commune, but they were like nomads all traveling together. And some of these people were people who, who had been making and selling LSD in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And you know, they couldn't go back to the United States, so they were living between Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru and Bolivia, you know, traveling. So that was very interesting. That was a, a lot of influence. So that's when you first did LSD in Cusco? No, I did LSD here in Lima, but I I, I, I didn't do good with LSD. No. I, I, LSD is not my thing neither, really. No, no, and um, so I, I What was your psychedelic that well, you uh, enjoyed? Well, it was very funny because San Pedro, you know, right. mescaline. Yeah. And because a group of surfer friends were in Chicama, uh -huh. and then they said, the, 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 way the, the way that got, that got to us, you know, is that they, they, they said, let's go check out some some brujos, some witch doctors. Uh -huh. And then, you know, so they went to the witch doctor and said, we want, we're going to take mescaline. And here, it's a, it's a long cactus. It's not like peyote. Right. It's San Pedro cactus. But they're cousins, right? Yeah. Apparently, what I understand is peyote is more stronger, no? Okay. But anyway, they went to this witch doctor and they, they drank San Pedro. And he was, you know, he left the room or the house or whatever it was in San Pedro de Yoc. <laughs> and they said, no, this is a ripoff, nothing. Do you feel anything? No, we don't feel, no, let's go. And then so they, they like when you leave without pain, so they, they left. And then they were running and then it, and then it, it, it exploded. I don't know how to, how, how. It how, came on. It came on and then so the, so the highway was like <laughs> bending, and they were all like, "Oh wow!" Damn. <laughs> and so, and, and, and it lasts eight hours. Uh -huh. So they decided to return and apologize and pay the guy, and the next day. <laughs> and so they learned to make it. Was basically it was just like boiling the, the cactus. But um, if the, the cactus has, if you cut it, you know, if right. you cut it. It's like a star. Yeah, it has lines. Right, and the lines, the, the skin around, it has stri strychnine, stri strychnina. Okay. How do you say that? I don't know, that sounds fine to me. Yeah, strychnine. <laughs> strychnine. So then we learned to, to, to peel it off and then boil it and then drink it. And um, so I, I, I learned that with San Pedro, it, it would it equalize me, you know, it, it's such a, the elemental in this plant is, is so friendly with humans that mm -hmm. I, I, I... It's all about love, right? It is. Yeah, it is. Like so, great. yeah, that was, that was a big discovery. And there's, there's people who are very, like, um, ceremonial. I'm going to do ceremony. And, and then they play little rattles or do this or do that. And... And when we have, we talk about this, the, it's like, you know, oh, but you did it, you did it recreationally and no, you're doing, you know, you, it's, that's not the right way to do, the right way to be spiritual or, and my conclusion was that the, 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 the plant itself, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a healer. So it heals you. Right. To me, it was when I was troubled by different things. I, I would take it and then it, I would be equalized, you know, I would just like be centered and, and, and mellowed out. And so it was, it's a, you know, it's a traditional medicine. I, I haven't taken it for many years now because when I started doing meditation, it wasn't, you know, the tradition doesn't recommend. I know people who meditate and also, to, you know, go to the jungle and, and love ayahuasca and all, but I, I, I just, I just stick to the, to the rules, you know. Right. Well, San Pedro is legal in Peru, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it so, grows everywhere, and it has to have like seven lines. They say. Right. It has to have seven mm -hmm. lines. I got some cactuses in my land right now, but 
not uh, cutting it quite yet. I got kind of, I got to feel the right moment to do it. Ideally, not by myself. Neither. Right outside here, there's a huge one. Uh -huh. But the guy is very crazy. Yeah, well, when I was a kid, me and my friends would go around and cut some San Pedro from people's entrances and run away with a towel on your bike and then drink it at the beach. Right. I wouldn't do that anymore. I have a little bit more respect than when I was like 17. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, but but it, was, it was a thing to do because, because of the age. Right. So you grew up in Peru. You were influenced by psychedelic rock music from North America. No, it's psychedelic like culture, basically. Culture. You were traveling a little bit. You were meeting interesting people. You were uh, dipping your feet feed in the psychedelic world. When did you actually start making music and getting as a musician that then became well, you know, successful at it? How did that happen? I, I would like to say something also was very interesting, uh, at least to me, mm -hmm. because I, I, I met these people who were from California and they were you know, hitchhiking and traveling. And uh, there was like a, it was a thing like people would be using uh, poncho and, and sarape and the sandals from Mexico because a lot of surfers, I remember I'm a big fan of, of Rick Griffins. Right. And he used to, he used to have a, a, an article in Surfer Magazine, it was Rick Griffin and Stoner. And, and he, his character was Murphy, was this blonde little guy surfing. And, uh -huh. and then, apparently he had some kind of accident or something. This is Leo Hetzel told me the story. Mm -hmm. That they ran into each other in, in some parking lot. And said, you look familiar, you do too. And then Rick Griffin was with the big beard and the long hair. Uh -huh. And then um, they, they, they kind of made friends or they had been friends or whatever it is. And he was drawing all these things. The, the, it was uh, Griffin and Stoner was uh, uh, a part of the magazine that they were going like to Mexico. There's some places, S Stoner, Stoner Point or something, was a place that Leo Helsa told me, I told Stoner how to get there. And now it has his name, like, uh -huh. you know? And so it's cool, you know, like that people, the, the origin of traditions and legends, you know, urban legends. Right. And anyway, Leo says, look at these drawings, you know, all, this is marijuana, the plants, and all these mushrooms. And uh, Rick Griffin wasn't er, Murphy anymore. It was this eye on a board. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, he, he, he made, he made cover, uh, record covers for the Grateful Dead. This, right. There's a particular one, and uh, people can Google it. It's... Uh, uh, Exo Moxo? Exo Moxo. I am the eye. Yeah, no. that's a sick cover. Such that's a record vinyl I don't have in my collection. It's right. Hard to find. So um, he, he did the one for uh, Quicksilver Messenger Service. Okay. It's a silver thing and it's a black record. It's, it's awesome. It's I'm gonna awesome. I'm going to have to look for it too. Right, yeah. It's Quicksilver Messenger Service, the first ever record. And uh, yeah, the, the cover is by Rick Griffin. So, but anyway, because we would imitate this culture, we started using the local ponchos and shit, uh -huh. you know, because our, the, 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 the culture here is so classist and so racist that, you know, the, the, the white boys like us... Don't use ponchos. No, we, we, we weren't taught to, to appreciate and, and love the, the, the nature culture. culture yeah. Right. So, it was there, and, but it's, you know, it's other people and uh, we don't mix with these kind of people. And then we started like going to Cusco and all these places and, and through, through these travelers, I started mixing with all, a lot of other different people and, you know, realizing they were all really cool people. And this, what is normal that happens is that you, you, it's not that you rebel, but you turn away from the way you were brought up, especially in the 60s. Mm -hmm. The whole idea was the plan society has for me. I'm not convinced, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that, that was the whole thing in the 60s. It was the psychedelic and hippie movement. <clears throat> There was the, the, the Black Panther movement, 
feminist movement, the anti, the, the pacifist anti-Vietnam War. So that was all the culture we grew up in. You know, we were part of that, and we liked it. It's, it's very not, transformational time. Right. Everything was changing. And Would you compare it to these times where things are also kind of going crazy? And right. Right. But for example, I have many feminist friends, they, they try to teach me the, the principles that I should go by to, in order to, do, to get it right. And my, my, my answer was, look, it's, it's not a thing that we have to honor women and their ideas. It was that movement, the first, that first they call it waves, this is like third wave of feminism or something. That first wave of feminism, it was us. It was not just the women. It was us that we were sharing that, those ideas. <laughs> Maybe this is stupid, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Yeah. Uh, because the thing with women, they started not wearing bras because it was oppress oppressive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for us, what we were doing, we were not using uh, underwear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, you know, it's more comfortable. And we were, you know, we were, we were, we were part of trying to, you know, go, go against the oppression of women and oppression in general. Right. So loosening up. So yeah, that, that was that was that was something I, I wanted to talk about. And because when I went to Spain, I, since I wasn't able to, to surf, I picked up the guitar. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine had taught me a couple of chords. And then I came to Peru and I had a lot of problems. Emotional and, you know, personality problems. And I was 19. And my, my, my mother saw that I was very relaxed playing. So she bought me a guitar. My sisters had guitar and had guitar lessons but not me. So, so I would pick up their guitar and she would see me play and, and, and be cool. So, so she gave me a guitar, my, my first guitar. It came from my mother. And then I went back to Spain for a couple of months. And then when I finally had to come back to Peru, the first thing I did, I, I bought a surfboard. But after a couple of weeks, I, I was m more connected to, to musicians than to my old surfer friends. And I started hanging out with a legendary band. Was El, was El Poling, okay. And Poling was a uh, some some guys from from the rock. Uh, this, they were they were rock and roll guys, but they had like really long hair, and they they were some from Miraflores, some were from Callao. It was uh, it was not like like rich rich kid because it was like mixed type of. Uh, you know, social mixed type of hippie, Peruvian hippie, and they were playing uh, Andino music. Okay. That was like, there was a band before that that, were, that we didn't know. We thought the Poland, Poland was the first band to play, you know, like Andino music with Kena and, and, you know, the pan flutes and all this with acoustic guitars and electric. And that's the first time I ever saw Cajon in a band. Oh, yeah. And uh, so, but it was it still rock? So it's rock with Andean instruments. No, it, it was it was people who came from rock, but they were doing like their own their own things mixed with Andino, and it, w it wasn't it wasn't like the 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 the, the, the or orthodox folk music from the Andes. It was more like A taking fusion. from here and taking from there. What would they would call indie folk? Okay. That was like the first indie folk kind of thing. And I, I was, um, to me, I liked that. I used to like it a lot, but I, I didn't play it at all. I was more, that was a time I realized that I wanted to learn to play blues. Because I liked the blues from, from rock music. I liked, you know, from the Stones, the best of the Stones were, were the blues. And then Jimi Hendrix, he was like, blues guy and cream and all this huge movement from from UK it, it, everybody was playing American blues and when I realized it was black artists who were the the real you know the origin of this the, music the real rockers and then so a friend of mine said look you know I just only listened to blues and that's what I did I only listened to blues and and it was I 
I, I was not very tolerant. And uh, I would go to a you know, party, and if there was no blues records, I wouldn't enjoy myself. Huh? <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's how I got into music. And then I started playing blues. And uh, through blues, because I wasn't listening to any rock, and this is in the 70s, I, was, I started listening to jazz, and then the jazz opened up the, the fusion thing. There was a huge moment of fusion, and, and uh, Brazilian was Brazilian music was very influential on, on, on jazz those years. So then I went to Brazil. I, I ended up going, like I went one time for a month, and, and that was in 73, and then in 76, I, I went six months and I stayed in, in Bahia almost all the time. And, you know, to learn, to learn the bachida. The bossa nova. And then when I came back, um, in mid-76, there was a TV show in somebody's house. And I see this guy, black, Afro-Peruvian guy, playing Creole waltz, but with all these jazz chords and bossa nova chords. And I say, wow, who's this guy? And then I, I, I knew through my family a guy by the name of Cesar Calvo. He's, he's a very influential poet. And um, he, was a, he was like a left-wing kind of uh, mentality guy. He was an uh, activist and militant. There's a, there's a photo of his that when, who was it, Nixon or Rockefeller came here, he's spitting. Oh, wow. They were manifesting, you know? <laughs> and he's, he's out there, he, the photo in Caretas in the <laughs> magazine. <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> he's, he's, so he wasn't allowed in the United States <laughs> for oh, that. Nice. And uh, so I told him, look, I saw this guy. He was very close to Chabuca Granda because he was a writer. Okay, nice. I, and I didn't know he was in, involved with Peru Negro. Okay. Peru Negro was, the, the name is Black Peru, which means the Afro-Peruvian culture. It was a, a performance of music and dance, and they did really well. And he was part of that band. He was writing lyrics for this, for this group. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so he said, no, I, I know this guy. His name is Felix Casaverde. Felix. And um, so we had curfew those years because it was... Because of the uh, military... Military government. So yeah. we had curfew. And the curfew was like midnight or 1 a.m. To, to like 6 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, and it's curfew in Spanish. It's toque de queda. It's toque, it's the, the, the tocar to play. Yeah. Okay. Of, of you know the the toque de queda means curfew. So right. the the people would get together, the toque a toque. Uh -huh. So that was that was the name of when you stay overnight at somebody's place and then you're partying. Oh, okay. You know it's not that you, it's not like a pajama parties. You right. go to somebody's place and then you're all these intellectual people were going and playing music. Nice. So that was happening at my parents' house. Okay, nice. After I came back from Spain, it was, even though my father was like a, a, a right-wing kind of mentality, his best friend was a communist guy from Uruguay. Okay. Who was exiled here, from whatever. And all these different people would be there. And so they would get together in my parents' place and then we would be up all night until the curfew let us go home at six in the morning. Uh -huh. So he, Cesar brought Felix, and I met Felix Casaverde, and then he says, yeah, actually I'm playing, I'm, I play guitar for Chabuca Granda, cool. and the cajon guy was Caitro Soto, and Caitro was a guy that Paco de Lucia saw for the first time, cajon, when Caitro was playing in 79 at the Spanish Embassy. Wow. Paco had come here touring, he was he was already big, really famous. And he sees this guy playing cajon. So they buy the cajon from him. 
And Ruben Dantas, the, the, the Brazilian percussionist, brought it over to Spain. And Paco says, it's on YouTube. I got the cajon in Peru. And one year later, all the gypsies were playing cajon. So the, the origin of the, the cajon is, there's a, a big thing in Peru that, the, you know, it's It's, it's, it's from Peruvian, here. right? Right. So the thing with Felix is he was the guitar player for Chabuca Granda, and Caitro was a cajon player. And then he, he, he has a cassette, he says, uh, La Señora, you know, the lady, she wants me to learn just, to, you know, to learn her songs just like the way they're played here. And it was a rehearsal of Chabuca with a other phenomenal, phenomenal guitarist, Lucho Gonzalez. Lucho Gonzalez, I think he was in high school when he was playing guitar with her. And he's the guy who like brought the, the bossa nova thing into into waltz, the Peruvian Creole waltz. So, and th that's how I knew about Lucho Gonzalez. And uh, so then I met Felix, and then I, I, I started having contact with the real uh, Afro-Peruvian scene. Mm -hmm. So you got into Afro-Peruvian music even before you got into rock, truly. <laughs> yep, because the thing is, I, I didn't want to do, play any rock. I wanted to play blues. Right. And then but when you blew up, you were a rock star right. or something. I decided that I was going to be a musician when I was, became 23. I turned 23 and I was in Brazil on this trip. So when I came back, I, I met Felix and then I, 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 I knew about the, 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 the whole Afro-Peruvian scene, which I didn't know about. And, um, and Felix was doing the thing that I wanted to, which is like fusing Afro-Peruvian with, with, with other elements. And uh, Caesar, uh, Cesar Calvo, we, uh, he one day said, do you know, he, I was playing the Afro-Peruvian style of guitar and, and he said, do you like this style of guitar? Yes, I love it. And he said, well, I was the guy who was writing the lyrics for Peru Negro. We should go meet Amador by Umbrosio in, in El Carmen, okay. which we did. Mm -hmm. So we went to meet Amador, and then we, he, he, he pro proposed that next week we come, you know, some friends from Lima, and have like a, a almuerzo, a lunch. Yeah. So that, that's what we did. And these friends, we were in a band. With, we were the, the band for Andres Soto. He was the guy who was going to take the place of Chabuca Granda. He was that big in the 70s. And so that's how we got to El Carmen and, and Amador invited us to come back and, and you know, and, and study with him. He was the, the, the Zapateo. He was not a violin player then. He, his kids were all young. His oldest kid was 15, 16 and there, was, there wasn't any cajon in El Carmen. They knew how to play, but nobody had one in their house because the, the, the politics were the, the agrarian reform in 68. This is 78. It was, had been 10 years of going down slope in, in, economically, being Peruvian agricultural country that did well. There was a lot of agricultural industry and it, it, it was commercially, it was uh, a failure and people were very poor. So people didn't have cajon in El Carmen when, when I met. Because they didn't have money for it. They weren't really interested. It wasn't. It, it wasn't what you got in the media. It was not the hip thing, uh -huh. you know. But when these white guys started coming, and we, we gave a cajon to Amador's family right then on a guitar, and and when these you know when these white guys come and, and, and see it's it's hip and cool, hey, I can do that too. And, you know, some of some of Amador's kids were not even doing the zapateo dance. They started doing it because to pick up girls, the white girls. <laughs> That's, that's my version. They probably have another version, but, you yeah. know. So the thing is, I, uh, I decided I, I, I wanted to do a career in music, but I was already 26. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I talked to my father, and, and he said he would be able to pay for me to go to the Berklee College of Music. Nice. And I, I, because I was old, I wasn't, didn't think I was going to be famous or anything. I wanted to be able to write music. And I, I went to study arranging, not even guitar. And then I went to Berkeley for 15 months. I, I studied really hard. And I went to visit my, 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 I had some friends in San Francisco. I went to visit them, 
they were all black, of course. And uh, we went to see Devo. Okay. And I say, dude, wh why, why are we watching these white guys? I, I'm really not interested in this black guy. I said, no, look, this is the de-evolution. This is, it's very, you know, it's, it's very good. It's, you know, pay attention. So it was I something did. very weird at the time. So this is what, early 80s by now? This is, yeah, 1980. And so I, I noticed that the political message was similar to Frank, Frank Zappa. It was very, you know, the, the politics there were, were protesting, you know. And uh, the music concepts were very interesting too because they were playing guitar and then everybody was playing synths. It was like a techno analog because they were playing, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't like programmed, but, and I thought it was really interesting. So that turned my attention to rock. And that was that's the years of police and the pretenders and, and Devo. And so I came back to Peru and being interested in rock, I started like experimenting and, 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 uh, and, and I started doing, I went to a festival of Nueva uh, Canción in Ecuador. And, and the, 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 the hero there was uh, Silvio Rodriguez and also Mercedes Sosa and she had invited Leon Gieco. Leon Kiko was a rock guy from Argentina. He, he was like Bob Dylan with, with a harmonica and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I understood that I could do like political content ly lyrics, but it didn't have to be like folk. It could be rock. So that's right. what I started doing. And my rock thing was with Cajon because my idea was to do jazz with Cajon, which was uh, I already was doing. I, started, I, I did the thing, that concept with rock and, and, and Cajon. And by accident, I had a tape that got into the radio and it got number one in, all of, in, the, in the whole country. And suddenly I'm a rock star. And because I, I did- What song uh, was that? Dímelo, dímelo. Dímelo, dímelo, okay. And uh, it was a protest song, you know. Yo, you know, dímelo, dímelo, tell me, tell me. You know, if you have no money, what's all this stuff on the TV that they're advertising? How are you gonna buy it? You know, th that's, that's, th that is a, a very, uh, subtle type of violence. Right. People trying to get all these things, and and you, can, you, never you can't even pay your bills. So no, why are no, they like making no. you feel bad? And, and it says, and it says, there's a part where it's, it stops. It's not like a rap thing, but but it says, you know, because I wasn't able to sing, I, I had to find my way through singing and and, and, and getting the words across. It's, there's so many beautiful things on television. For whose house is it? Because people, you know, they just have adobe walls, and uh, the, the the floor is is is, is dirt floor, right. and you, pour, you know sweep it and pour water in it, and it gets hard. So you know what's all this? So that was part of the song. So that was huge. And then I, I also by accident, the the record company for Charlie Garcia, they gave me a contract to go and record in Buenos Aires. So. Uh -huh. I met Charlie Garcia and Andres Calamaro, all these mm, South American rock stars. And yeah, they're, e they're even, you know, after 20, 30 years, they're, they're still super big. Right, huge legends. And I recorded with them, we hang out with them. and Sick. That, that was, was really like, amazing. That like, was, yeah, that was. music with Charlie Gonzalez as you're yeah. just starting out your music career. Right, so it was like, I couldn't believe it. But I didn't do good internationally, I just, did good here, and I did three rock records in the 80s, and then in the 90s, I, I went back to my roots, and mm -hmm. I was playing, you know, which was Afro-Peruvian music, and the, and the family, Amador's family in, in El Carmen, I brought them to play with me, they were part of my band, and then I, at the end of the, at the so end of the 80s, I asked Amador, why don't you, you know, I had two of his sons in my band, one playing guitar, one playing drums. The economy was bad. It, it was, it was, the inflation was insane. So we were just four. And I started playing with Amador and the band and, and some of the other guys, kids he had. We were 12 and 13 and 14 playing cajon. And, and we put on this show and we had such a good time. That's when I made the Akundun record, which is like a Afro-Peruvian, it's also like the first Peruvian reggae album too, right? Right, because to me, it was like Afro-Peruvian reggae. When I play that record to my friends, when I, I brought that vinyl back to my friends, I play at parties, they're all like, 
wow, it's really weird. It's kind of like African-y, reggae, but in Spanish. It's like right, such an right, right. fusion. So, so, so that was it. And then, you know, that did really well. I got a contract in Miami with Polygram at the time, and it was like an international contract. But that didn't go do good either. So, I, you know, I kept it up until the other 90s. And then when, when I, somebody passed me a, 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 a tape of uh, Fat Boy Slim. And then, Fat Boy Slim. Then I went crazy. <laughs> the first record. And then I, this, you know, computer-based music. I thought it was so cool. And uh, that's what I started doing then. You know, I started remixing all my stuff in drum and bass. And, uh, you know, it was, it was the Chemical Brothers, Fat Boy Slim. I was a big fan of um, so, so Tal Talvin Singh and Ronnie Size, drum and bass. Mm -hmm. so, so that's when you went electronic. I went electronic. How, I want to I pick at little things. As you're jumping over the whole rock era, you're like a hippie surfer dude. And all of a sudden, you're a rock star. I, I, I just, I'm curious. <laughs> how was that experience? How did you react to it? How was it dealing with the media who sometimes attacks well, their, their favorite stars? Well, How was that experience of being a rock star before you kind of said, well, now I want to do electronic music, which they might have been weird? Yeah, uh, the thing is that I, I started paying my bills with rock because I was a teacher. I was a private teacher. I had a little studio and, uh, you know, I gave guitar lessons and harmony lessons t to make a living. And I played in somebody's orchestra. Not even, I wasn't the good player, so I was in the B, you know. Mm -hmm. When he has two gigs and then the, the A orchestra and then he goes to this gig and then he goes to the other, but the, you know, it's the same, same name, but the bands are different. Right. So I was doing all these things and I was able to pay my bills with the rock thing. And it also went really well with my ego and personality. I was like, you know, I was, I was rowdy, and it was when you're a rock star, you're expected to be rowdy. So like, I was, I was happy. Uh -huh. I was really happy. It was a good time. That's like the '90s. You no, guys blew up when you were in your '40s, right? No, this is '85. 85. But the thing is, I, I, because I wasn't young. I was 33 when I did my first record, my first album. Right. So, it, it you know, success got to me in a different way, and I was. I was really angry at the press because I had already been to El Carmen. I had already been in, in contact with this ru rural Afro-Peruvian uh, town. All, all this culture that was not even in, was not even in the mainstream. It was like I felt I was Alan Lomax recording Robert Johnson. That's how I felt when I was in El Carmen. I'll, still, even now, there are things that I hadn't heard that. There's not like from the slaves, but it's like this tradition, Afro-Peruvian tradition, mm -hmm. super roots. And uh, <clears throat> so I was really mad at the press people when they were asking me things and very light and superficial, right? stupid stuff. And, and I had been doing like really serious cultural exchanges. Uh, right. So, right. and uh, so, the, you know, I was I was not a nice guy with the press, so they're all scared of me. And they attacked you too a few times, right? Right, right, right. They have to. Yeah, that's right. their job. How was that? Like, I, I I'm sensitive artist that when people insult me on comments on Instagram, I feel affected. How it is for like the press to be like, same. This guy, because they attacked you for being a racist at one point, which makes no sense since you're hanging out with all this black culture, and they attacked you for having songs that were tied into cocaine culture I guess like uh, Vamos a Tocache because it's like no yeah because area, but the, the thing is you had a song about a coca leaf which is not about cocaine but you know right but like that's it's culture it's it's culture and the thing is they have to always find something that will sell so it, it's it's never like the the essence it's always like the side thing that, that gets attractive and that's what they do so you know it, it affects me, like, like you say, it affects me a lot, but I try to keep away, you know, and, and uh, put a, a barrier, you know. Sometimes I've, I've made comments of, 
of something and then it, it goes viral but negative right i don't read i don't listen so yeah. it goes you know it's like a wave right. a big wave you know that <laughs> make tumbles <laughs> makes you tumble and then you just keep still and then it'll let you go and right you've learned okay. to not give a fuck and just no. let things pass no. which is always the best added to to all these things no choice so as Peru had embraced you as a rock star for over a decade and all of a sudden you're like, oh, now I'm doing electronic music, mostly techno or down tempo? No, 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 it was, it was down tempo. It was like chill out. Okay. I had, I had this, this collection of songs and I was free. I was free to do anything because I was not, you know, like my, my, my first gig was a, a, a house party. Tech house and house that was a big thing and and then I there was two young guys here Is, Is, Israel Beach and Christian Berger and I asked them to help me out I had to go and they were at the gig they were like famous you know and I was already 55 and they were 24 and 23 my teachers were you know young guys and mm -hmm. so then I got I started started to like house music so my first record was, that was a big success because nobody expected the, the you know, Andean folk traditions. This is not the tourist music. You, you have to make a difference. Right. What the tourists consume is not what the local people do. You have to understand, understand one thing. The, the Andean music is mainly, the ritual music is it's mainly agriculture events that occur in time you know and during the year there's all these you know like when you when you put the seeds in the in the land when you prepare the land where you prepare the water the the, the ditches the, the the irrigation system is scientifically technically is very sophisticated and it comes from before the spanish the spanish the, the agricultural techniques are amazing mm -hmm. south america uh, technique it's not European and uh, all, all, all these activities are relate they're all done with music right. so, and that's what the, they do these communities do the music for themselves as part of their rituals right. this is not what the tourists get right. so this was what I did in my record my first record my, my first uh, CD of electronic music was this 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 type of music that I call it the, 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 the authentic all music is authentic but this is the one that the communities do for themselves it's right. not it's very cultural it's not for right for, and then so, so you went looking for it and you recorded it and then you mix it with because I, I had already been recording these artists and then you know I was I was hey can you do this with a, if I put a kick drum if I put a beat some could some couldn't but I learned to you know I learned to, to to cut and paste in the computer and I came up with this record it was electronic music which, which was not popular here and folk Andean music which which is like segmented to only the and Andean crowd the Andean immigrants in the big cities mm -hmm. working class people you know like the lowest type of uh, labor right and uh, so everybody went crazy with this and I did really well again so I was back 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 on the map but that, that, that must have felt so amazing that you uh, brought up this uh, marginalized kind of music reinvented it a little bit for a more modern taste and right because that's a that's my place as a musician and I missed interested in the culture and I have this from the hippies you know this is this is I, I recognize that's where I learned it from because I went to the to the to a private Catholic school you don't get taught that, you know. Most of the guys that I went to school with, with they were going to run the country, and some of them still are running the country. You know, they're, they're the, the CEO of big corporate banks and hotel chains. And that's right. a, you know, I went to school with these guys, and it wasn't like I'm a weird guy. I'm, you know, I'm still friends with them, but my, my interests are different. So right. to me, it was not, to me, it was, I, I didn't know I would, be successful. I just did it because I thought I had to do that and, and that's what I do. 
mm -hmm. I think I have to do it and I do it. I consider right. myself an artist. I'm not a, how do you say, a comerciante, another big hawk. You're not a dealer of, you know, yeah. of art, songs. Art, yeah. marchand d'art. Right. You know, I don't sell art. I feel personally that I think you deserve to have your music listened to outside of Peru and I hope this uh, interview, which is a little bit more of an outside Peru kind of audience, gets the chance to go to right. your Spotify and hear more of your work and right. you get some gigs. Vicky Gonzalez Music, Instagram, they can go there and then they can... Mm -hmm. there, there's one guy, you know, last interview we did last year, and there's a guy who said, I'm following you because Chris Dyer says to follow you and I hope I... I had didn't uh, let him down. <laughs> let him down. Disillusion the guy. <laughs> well, being a Instagram social media uh, sharer, a content content provider is another job in itself that we have not been trained to do. So, you know, I think as long as you keep on sharing your music and your vibes and your heart, that's really right. uh, what people are looking for. What people are starving for. Yeah, there's a lot of nice. Uh, authentic, real things that are important to share with the culture. I mean. Right. So that's that's my main thing. That's that's what I like to do. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Miki. I really appreciate you. Thank you to you. <laughs> it was awesome to be here in Barranco and have a nice conversation with you. And we're not all burnt up. No, no. We had a mellow day. It's the warm, clouds. but we didn't have the sun burning yeah, us. The clouds helped. Well, thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoy our conversation with Miki Gonzalez, aka Mikongo. Please go and listen to his uh, music on Spotify and uh, also follow him on Instagram. And uh, please like, share, comment, spread the good vibes of this awesome podcast we got for you guys. And I'll see you next week. Blessings. Peace. On our next episode, we will have Conrad. Now, you were telling me that you are painting a lot of jaguars these days, that you want to get closer to something that's more traditionally Peruvian. For me, jaguar is, is the soul. Is the soul to Latin America. The jaguar is stayed in, uh, you have jaguar soul in, in the jungle in Peru. In jungle in Mexico, Ecuador, and different parts around Latin America is the be the best country, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the big country. The, my country no is the government, no right. is the politics. My my country is the people, and it's it's you and my brothers, yeah. you know. And yeah. keep love. Totally. The haters is only fast time, little time. Uh, Noise everything, you know? Totally. Well, I agree with that. Woo! <laughs> so make sure to subscribe, like, and everything else. Big thanks, and see you next week. Peace!